Thank you so much for that. That was, I feel embarrassed. That was a nice introduction. Um, and thank you, um, Tommy and Peter and Mama, and uh, the parts of it that I don't know that are doing work, that aren't doing work. Um, so, yeah, so what I, in talking about, or wanting to talk about fiction in its relationship to philosophy, in this kind of roundabout way, I want to say philosophy is philosophy is not a fiction, um, only to, only to the extent that it recognizes its, its fictional aspects, and a large of that, a, a large part of that is that it recognizes the role and function of idealism, and so a lot of philosophy recently, but also you know going back. Um, you know, since the history of philosophy itself, there's been this kind of allergic reaction to idealism, that idealism is like the guilty pleasure of philosophy that it should not, um, it should not entertain. Idealism is something that um, philosophy should move away from, that idealism is something that's always naive, that idealism is these thoughts that the whole, the whole world can be plucked out of the head, you know, this kind of, this dangerous, um, temptation of philosophy is something that must be avoided at all costs. And so, you know, I want to say that idealism in that form or anything like that form never existed. Um, I think it's just become this ghost that's, that haunts philosophy and that they constantly invoke, but that the proof for this kind of thinking isn't really there. And that because of not acknowledging what idealism actually can do positively, um, whether it's in the form of fictionalism or some other form of idealism, uh, philosophy kind of lets this this actual form of nihilism in the back door, in a way. So, okay. So a lot of this. Once, once idealism starts to get, uh, you know, is seen in this kind of platonic form and is somewhat abandoned um, as philosophy progresses and then kind of gets re-engaged again and the constructive power of, of the mind, you know, gets taken seriously uh, in Kant, of course, who is, his particular form of idealism gives birth to even broader and broader um, powers of the ideal after him. And so the question, the question that kind of, this kind of anxiety about uh, the power of the mind to create is something that Kant recognizes in dogmatic philosophy. Um, people, like, people like Leibniz or Spinoza, he thinks that you know, they're generating too much of the world out of their thoughts and we need to kind of we need to kind of put the brake on this to control this in some way. Yet at the same time, at the same time, he wants to say that there's this constructive synthetic power to thought. There's this imaginative capacity to thinking that he can't quite, he doesn't want to let go. And that, you know, he sort of famously says in the Critique of Pure Reason that, you know, imagination and this, the, the power to create the, f the forms of thinking or to create schema lies in the, you know, in the depths of the soul. Um, and I always thought it's a, bit, it's a bit of a weird remark for Kant um, in some ways. He even makes it more romantic in the second, in the second version because in the first version he said in the depths of the mind and he actually makes it to soul in the second edition. So on the one hand you have this, as, as philosophy, modern philosophy develops, you kind of have this um, emphasis on the thinker being the, the, the creator, the constructor, but that they shouldn't sort of overcreate or overconstruct, and this kind of this move back and forth between skepticism and dogmatism or empiricism and rationalism gets sort of so this tension gets solidified a bit in Kant. But then after Kant, of course, you have German idealism and this. You know, the idea that they, they take Kant's problem seriously, but they think he, you needed to create more, you need to generate more, you need to have some kind of system, that having the critical thought wasn't sufficient enough to do philosophy. 
there's this famous uh, jab at the German idealists that they they ran through the door that Kant only wanted to peek through. You know, <laughs> Kant wanted to be to like take metaphysical questions seriously, but not create these big systems which he was trying to be sober against. So. So in terms of, so because of this, and then you have, so then you have the kind of reaction against German idealism that it was the kind of most over the top, uh, you know, ridiculous form of abstraction, speculation. It just kind of went out of control. Um, you know, the amount of nasty jabs at Hegel and him trying to create, you know, contain the whole world. I mean, there's, you know, endless amounts. Um, Schopenhauer has some very funny ones uh, about Hegel spinning cobwebs in the bushes of German universities. Um, but after this point, idealism really becomes this kind of specter, this kind of bad form of thinking. And so the, the assumption is, is that idealism means against materialism or against realism that you yeah, that, that, that you're assuming that the subject or that thought as a process is, ca is actually capable of replacing the world or generating things that supplant the world in some way. And yet, as is evident in the German idealists and even the idealists that follow them, the British idealists, the American idealists, um, they never saw themselves as, as, as doing that. They saw themselves as being realists, but about the way ideas behave. So it's not that the world is actually made out of ideas, but that certain aspects of the world seem to behave in, in the way that the mind behaves. So maybe there's some connection there, but this doesn't mean that the whole world is an idea or is composed of ideas. But thinking seriously how ideas how ideas take shape, how they interact with one another, they think is an important aspect of philosophy, but not all what philosophy should do. And this part of this, um, this history and, and this relationship is interesting in the way in which Plato, like for instance, Plato's myths get viewed later on. Because it was still an open debate in a lot of the literature as late as the 1950s whether Plato's myths were actual myths, or what, like whether Plato believed they were actually true, or whether they were just um, representational aids. And this debate was not a closed one, um, whereas now the general thought is like, okay, you know, Plato was an idealist through and through. He thought these things were real, but they came out of his head, and you know, there's this like weird argument. Um, but in, in, the, in the 50s, there was arguments between this guy Ritter and um, Arthur Lovejoy, who's quite famous, about whether, you know, um, what the status of Plato's myths were. Were they, just, were they just fictions? Were they myths in that they're things meant to be dispelled and overtaken um, by more rational thinking? Or is there something about the form of the myth itself that is a fiction but more than a fiction? It's it's trying to think abstract concepts, you know, cosmological ones, time, love, things that are kind of hard to talk about, uh, in this semi-narrative form, but, in it, but that is more than a narrative. So this is the kind of argument that's going on. And one case that's interesting is the kind of the idea of the myth of the cave, which is, you know, the, the part of Plato that everyone is forced to learn, usually. Um, that what's often forgotten in the kind of history and in, in this function of this myth is that that myth is the second attempt at telling a diff at telling the story of the way in which ideas and uh, reality relate, how ideas come into the world. Because the myth of the cave is the kind of is the attempt to simplify the story, um, whereas the divided line, you know, this idea of like drawing the line in the dirt and showing. Uh, where ideas and appearances and, and things in the world are and how they relate to one another is the kind of first attempt. And what's interesting there is that the myth in frequently in, in Plato has a kind of diagrammatic diagram feature. It's about, it's a demonstration. It's not supposed to stand on its own in this way. It's very much tied to 
how and to whom certain stories can be can be demonstrated. That once the idea is there, the myth can be the myth can be maybe not forgotten, but it can be set aside. And so, you know, idealism and even the the, the much you know the later idealisms of whether the German idealists or the British idealists, they really turned they turned back to Plato and. Um, and Aristotle to, to a lesser extent, and trying to see that really what Plato was trying to do is dramatize abstraction. That in, or it's very hard to get a grip on how abstra abstractions and concepts behave, and so dramatizing them in the form of myth or in the form of certain fictions makes them graspable in a way that, you know, in a way that doesn't override or destroy their connection to the material world but just shows that they have their own kind of behavior with each other. There's a kind of ecology of ideas. And the way in which concepts interact with one another requires a kind of fiction, or requires a dramatization in some sense. Okay. And so part of why I think this kind of clarification of idealism is, is important, and it's... Um, Having, having gone through and been a been a part of this like speculative realism and the kind of things that's kind of return to realism, is that whenever you look to these these returns to realism, or um, emphasis on mat on materialism, this kind of caricature this caricature of idealism is always there. This idea that we don't want to be naive idealists, we don't want to be merely idealists, or these kinds of lines are always are always present. Um, and what's interesting for me is what the idealists, you know, that many of the idealists, even the most kind of hardcore abstract ones, were very, very critical of the self, and very, very critical of the, of, of the thinker or the philosopher as able to do anything. Um, that f they have this intense form of skepticism against what the subject actually is. It seems to be a structure. It's something apart, something part of the world that's capable of grasping concepts, but it having a more substantial function. Um, you know, even in even in someone like Bradley, who's a forgotten figure now, a British idealist, the self is just a, he just calls it like a mass of feeling. He doesn't want to say anything else, anything more substantial about the subject, other than it's this kind of mass of feeling that ideas pass through. So. Rather than I, rather than idealists trying to make the whole world ideal, or to say that the whole world comes out of the subject, or that idea is the only thing that matter, they're really interested in seeing what's what's the kind of map, what's the what's the domains of the world in relationship to the domains of the ideas, because it seems like con certain kinds of concepts and ideas are interrelated to each other, and they're attached, you know, they're attached to reality. But these two maps seem to shift in ways that don't necessarily correspond. I mean, why do certain ideas fall out of fashion while others do not? You know, these kinds of questions um, is what they're trying they're trying to look at. So, one place this emerges in uh, contemporary thought. And it really kind of has to do with the kind of fallout of Hegel, you know, which is, I don't know, sometimes you say Hegel, people kind of collectively groan, um, depending on, on, on how much they've been uh, exposed to him. But, you know, F Foucault had this, had this line in his lecture uh, was after uh, Jean Hippolyte's death where he said, you know, we can set off on the path thinking we've escaped Hegel, but if we're not careful, we just come around back to him. Um, sort of difficulty of escaping him, and so much of the, and I mean Foucault's comment is especially relevant in in his context because so much of French philosophy, post you know, after the war is about these kind of two treatments of 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 Hegel, this kind of phenomenological, more kind of narrative treatment. Um, psycho psychological or psychoanalytic form of Hegel and Kojev and Lacan in this kind of stream, 
or the, the, the thinkers who focused on the, on the logic and the, the categorization of knowledge, like Hippolyte, and then of course Foucault and Deleuze is also in this line, but a bit different. So one of the aspects of this kind of this, again, this legacy that idealism is trying to be this massive container that's trying to contain everything with thought. One of the kind of outcomes of this is um, Larouel's non-philosophy, and or he called non-standard philosophy. He calls it now. Um, and what Larouel claims, um, and he started publishing, I think, in the '60s. I want to say his his career is very much in line with Badu's, that kind of are about the same age and have been publishing um, quite regularly for 50 years. Um, and so what Laura Well wants to argue is that all of philosophy, um, but he seems to be taking a particular aim at Hegel, or it often seems this is the case, that, that philosophy has this problem of the dis decisional circle, this idea that philosophy says, okay, this is a fact about the world, you know, that subjects exist or whatever. Um, knowledge works this way. They find proof in the world. They find the data that says, aha, this backs up the claim I just made. And then it's just this circle. So that there's not, there's not a real question of this first move of how thought or how philosophy obtains on the world. So Laurel thinks philosophy kind of deludes itself into thinking that it's finding things in the world and it's actually making things and then making the world conform to this model. And this, this kind of circle is, is very similar to, um, for those of you that know, those of you that know Mayasu's work, it's very similar to this kind of correlationist problem, this idea that subject and object are always are kind of feeding back into, into one another, that in modern philosophy, uh, it's this relationship that the idea that the that knowledge has to be kind of part of the subject, or that that the subject always defines knowledge, always already, is is very much related to Laura Wells' critique. Um, I think uh, Ray Brassier said that the decisional circle is like the the genetic code for the correlationist problem. <laughs> it's like this sort of simplified structural version. So. What Laurel tries to then claim is says, okay, what we need to do is, is have this, we need to recognize that philosophy thinks it's, it's thinking the world, um, it needs to recognize it's actually, it should think according to um, objects. So the idea that we should think according to and not think, uh, we should not, you know, think, um, think the world as such, that we can think things as such. This idea that that thought is something that, what thought can do is it picks up on the importance of something, you know, he says, in the last instance. So all that philosophy can really do is kind of, it kind of picks up on the most recent uh, important factor of some object. That, that it's, it's, philosophy's job is to kind of catch the, the tail end of existence and pull it forward. <laughs> that it's supposed to find, it's supposed to do justice to the real. So, and for him, this changes depending on the type of thinking you engage. You know, in Marx, he says the kind of real of Marx is labor. You know, the problem of labor is like the thing that you really should take from Marx. And because it's something that you can always find in existence. You can find as always there at every instant. And so, Laurel relates this to what he calls um, philo fiction. So he says that you know philosophy has always been fictional; it's just been bad, badly fictional because it hasn't recognized that it's being fictional. So this kind of last instance, this idea that we should think things according to them, is to basically recognize their import and then speculate about what that means, what that could mean for every other object, or what that could mean if that if the problem of labor was spread to everything, or the problem of you know, um, the self, or the problem of a difference, or whatever these kinds of core concepts in the different philosophies he investigates. So this kind of, this philo fiction, he kind of calls hyper-speculation, or it's hypothetical accept acceptance. You know, you say, 
in these, each particular philosophies, they have this privileged object, this privileged thing, and so we should behave as if, as if it's real and, and map the consequences, see all the dimensions of it. And he wants to kind of argue that all these concepts are equally valid. It's kind of, um, it's a, it's a kind of radical pluralism in a way. Um, but at the same time, he always wants to emphasize the power of non-standard thought or non-standard philosophy to find the edge of it, to sort of find um, its most recent manifestation. So, <clears throat> what's interesting is that a lot of the a lot of the forms of thinking fictions or in, in thinking myth and thinking um, the ideal in philosophy often seem to be circling around three kinds of issues, which is like you know the object, the domain or the place, and then the kind of approach or method, the idea, the, the way in which you move between those things, between the way in which the subject or the thinker or whatever moves between the domain of the thing and the thing. And so in, in, Laura, in the instance of Laura Well, in the philo fiction, he kind of wants to suspend the question of place. Like everything is equal in terms of everything is in this one kind of mesh of the world. And he wants to say that the trick is how do we think according to the object? So this kind of idea of place um, falls out. On the other side of this, this kind of flip side of, of Laura Will's philo fiction would be something like uh, theory fiction in Negristani's work, um, which is also related, but not the same as this uh, concept of hyperstition, which comes out of a lot of work on Deleuze in the mid to late 90s in the UK. And so this kind of theory fiction mode is, is kind of the opposite in terms of instead of assuming the power of thought can find the kind of edge of the object's importance in the last instance and then fictionalize this, theory fiction basically says there's no, there's no hope of doing that. What we should do is create the concepts that we want to exist in the world and then basically um, convince people to make them real. <laughs> so it's the kind of like underhanded, sneaky version. Um, this idea that you know this kind of hyperstition, this mix of hype and superstition, is that it's this you know kind of rampaging creation of concepts, in creating concepts that you create stories around and you create fake personas around, you create this concept that oh yeah this this theory was invented a hundred years ago by this made up person, but of course you don't say it's made up by this person, so on and so forth, and other people proliferate the hype and they kind of play with the fiction, they expand it and, and grow it. And um, so there's this kind of backwards causation at work, or it's this, it's this attempt to sort of backwardsly, backwardsly cause concepts, to say this concept has legitimacy now because it has its history, but this history is totally fictional. But if the fiction affects people, if the, if the fiction seems to have a conceptual import, then why does it matter that it's fake? Um, so the one instance of this is, I think it's, um, Borges has the piece Kafka and his precursors, in this piece where he says, when he's called, you see, you can see authors before Kafka, they're Kafka-esque. But it's like, well, but are, were they, were they Kafka-esque? Or are they Kafka-esque now because we, like, spread Kafka everywhere? <laughs> in terms of the criticism, like, this concept just seems to already be there. It already existed before Kafka. Um, and so this kind of idea of influence um, is, is this, is the, uh, so this sort of hyperstition and theory fiction is trying to play with this, this idea that if the ideas have import, if they work, then, then they, should be, they should be employed. So it's weirdly fictionalist, it's kind of it emphasizes fiction, but it's very pragmatic in a way. You know, if it has, conceptual grasp than it should be. Okay. How am I doing? So, so again, to keep in mind the sort of object domain and then 
subject or it could be speaker or um, actor. The, this, this model appears in a stream of analytic philosophy which has which is taken off in the la uh, last few years especially. It, it started to bubble up I guess in the late 80s and then uh, emerge in the 90s. And one of the kind of histories of this is this guy Arthur Fine has, uh, wrote about fictionalism and that there was one very strange thinker uh, <laughs> who wrote this massive book in 1877 that didn't get published until 1911. His name was um, Wahanker, and he wrote, this, he wrote this book called The Philosophy of the As If. And so it's just this massive book about what as if means in philosophy. It's really bizarre and fun to read. It's online. It's, you know, open access because it's old and forgotten. Um, but What's interesting is that Wahanger was, you know, did not see himself as an idealist or interested in these problems at all. He saw himself actually as a positivist, as a scientific positivist, like hardcore, how does science work? Uh, but he thought in order to describe how science worked, at least in his time, the late um, 19th century, that you had, to, you had to admit fiction as part of science. Um, And he thought there was, of course, virtuous uh, or scientific fictions and vicious or like manipulative fictions, which would fall into the hypertition category, probably, because it's openly manipulative. Um, but uh, what he sort of said that it was very important for science that you have fictions, but fictions that say from the outright they are fictions. So self-aware fictions, he thought, was something indispensable for scientific knowledge. And so Arthur Fine, uh, this guy who wrote this paper on Wagner in uh, 97, kind of says that, you know, though Wagner was seen as kind of a kook at the time, that he really presaged all these problems about what's the role of intuition in science, what's the role of thought experiments in science, what's the role of models in science. These things that aren't necessarily, part, that are part of the kind of character of hypothesis, but their scientific status, especially when you do philosophy of science, is not clear. Like, what is, what is, the, uh, what is the ontology, or what's, what's the existential stake of something like a thought experiment for science? Is it just a fiction that you can then set aside? Or is it more like the kind of pl the platonic narrative that it explains something, but it doesn't sufficiently explain it, but it means it should be developed? Like, what's the... What's the relationship there? So, um, so this this school of fictionalism and philosophy, which has really taken off since the '80s, they generally see themselves as responding to David Lewis. I don't know if anyone, how familiar people are with David Lewis. Uh, a lot of continental people like to point him out as a crazy person in the analytic camp, sometimes. Uh, because David Lewis, an Australian philosopher, uh, kind of was really interested in, in modal statements and the idea of possibility, you know, what does it mean to say something could happen, would be, should be, um, all these kinds of claims you make that are not straightforwardly true or false. How do we, how do we uh, solidify the, how these things function? And so Lewis's thing, which is... Um, was to argue that these kinds of statements are true, but they might not be true in our world. They could be, they could be true in another world, in a possible world, which, um, you know, some people thought he was totally crazy. Uh, there's even like a name for the response to his philosophy, which is called the incredulous stare. People are just kind of like, what are you talking about when you make this kind of claim? Like it's actually, to have a name to the reaction to your philosophy is pretty good. Um, But he said, like, no, like, if we're, gonna, if we're going to say that these things matter and that, that they have a kind of uh, philosophical import, there needs to be a real world where this happens. Um, but our world and those worlds never touch. <laughs> and world means the whole cosmos and its entire history. So, I mean, that's, there's a lot to go into in Lewis, and I'm not, not going to go down that rabbit hole.
But the fictionalists, this group of thinkers who followed Lewis, wanted to say, well, we want to have, we want to argue that these uh, statements about m m probability and modality, that they matter, but we don't want to have to say that other worlds exist, but we want to be able to say that they have some import. So these fictionalists um, divide speech and they divide the way in which we, how we think in this kind of domain, object, and um, subject way. So the four forms, like four forms of this, there's one called instrumentalism, which means when you say something, you're just, you're pretending to assert it. You don't actually, you don't actually know if you mean it or not. <laughs> so it's like in terms of that, that the thing has being in the sentence you're saying. So for instance, when you say unicorns have one horn, you're not saying you're asserting for sure that unicorns have one horn. You're saying unicorns have one horn and I think this matters to some people. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's kind of like the weakest version. And then there's this form of metafictionalism where it means somebody is actually asserting what they're saying. So that you're saying, okay, actually unicorns have one horn, but it's in a particular domain. So this only means something in the, fiction, the domain of fiction or the domain of a fairy tale, for instance. So like, I really mean this statement, but only when I'm talking to my six, you know, six-year-old niece or something, right? Um, and then, so this is, then they get like more and more convoluted. Um, so you have this kind of object fictionalism, which means when you say the unicorn has one horn, you're saying, well, there's some aspects of the world which would allow me to make this statement but it doesn't mean that I'm saying unicorns are real, but it doesn't mean that they're only real in myth or fiction. It means that um, somewhere between the relationship between myth and fiction, we can agree that this is the case. So it just, it just becomes a collectivized form that we can debate about. We can debate and decide um, how committed each of us are to this idea. And then the kind of last form is just called, it's called figuralism. The idea that all statements are just figures. And this idea that you would say unicorns have one horn, um, but this only means something as long as you're committed to it, but this might also exceed your commitment to it. Because if it's in a fictional domain, you might not, not know everything about this fictional domain. So, I mean, what's interesting to me is that this, that whole form of thought and this kind of this idea of fictionalism is this kind of way of saying, okay, we want to talk about how we think and the way in which we speak, whether we want to say things are real or not, or where realness of certain things belongs or not, um, without making any claim about the world, without making any, any claim about the object we're talking about. Um, but you know, these same kinds of, of thinkers would totally a disregard and run from any notion of idealism. They would say, like, no, it's like not idealism. We're talking about the way we speak. You know, we're just talking about the way we speak and think, but we're not talking about where that happens or the material of those statements. Which, you know, to me, I want to say that's more idealistic than the idealists were. Because it basically separates the, this, these kinds of enunciations and the statements we make as something that's purely about our minds and how we talk to other people. But they don't have, they don't have any import outside of that. And so in, in all of these, in all these like instances in the way, in this kind of philo fiction of Lara Well and the theory fiction, the hyperstition of the CCRU and the theory fiction of Negristani or the, this kind of fictionalism, there's, in order to sort of avoid idealism, but also at the same time avoid uh, having too strong a claim to ontology or metaphysics, they kind of push themselves into this this more and more fictional spoken realm. Um, but where what fiction is for them, or what the sort of what saying something is a fiction, like that statements are fictions, that thoughts are fictions. To me, is even is, becomes more divorced from reality, or more divorced from like sense and experience and the things which feed into these ideas, 
than the classical forms of idealism. And so where I think this where I think this um, where I think this leads to is in a way trying to reassess the relationship between between realism, materialism, and idealism. And there was you know that this idealism just being this negative thing which is defined which realism and materialism defines itself against that didn't really exist in the form that they claim um, just makes more and more realisms and more and more materialisms which have to go to strange strategies and strange lengths in order to justify how the very practice of philosophy or of making statements occurs. And so this kind of space of, of philosophizing itself becomes more and more divorced from the kind of history of philosophy. That philosophy, in its attempts to run from idealism, becomes even like a more naive form of idealism. And so, to, to me, the, the kind of question of, of, of idealism is to really focus on the, the question of domain. That whereas it's often cartooned or, or made into a character of, of, again, like of engulfing the whole world, of making the whole world into thought, of, of seeing like what thought or the subject can capture, that it's really, it's about the relationships of ideas in the, across various domains, seeing like which, which ideas function where, and that the subject is actually reduced in by idealism in order to move across these spaces and across these maps is what idealism was was attempting to do, especially in its later forms, in in the work of people like uh, Bradley and Boston Katz, these kind of forgot, totally forgotten British idealists. Because for them, they were interested in um, the kind of shape and behavior of of ideas. So that, and for them, you know, they didn't see themselves as being against realists or against rationalists. Uh, they saw themselves as being realists about ideas. That if we want to take ideas and their, their effect, whether in myth form, in fictional form, as a concept in philosophical practice, you have to take them seriously that they have a kind of behavior, they have a kind of life of their own that's never divorced from, from sense or experience, but that as soon as we think of them as ideas, they start to behave differently. And why is this the case? And I think one of the interesting attempts, um, you know, instead of this, instead of this uh, fictionalism, which tries to kind of just say how fictional statements can be, how fictional our thought can be. Uh, that looking at the way actual fictions work says more about what idealism was trying to do. And the sort of the, the use of fiction and narrative and myth and idealism is more actually about just the way stories are constructed and the way fictions are written. Um, and that so this kind of object place and then method of access in the notion of just writing fictions becomes this kind of entity, so sort of the object becomes entity, the place becomes the genre, and the method becomes the format, or the kind of writing, the kind of fiction. And the, in, the, in these terms, I think it's a, it's a bit more clear what it was idealism was trying to do. Because idealism was about saying, oh, it seems like certain, these kinds of, these kinds of objects seem to be in this domain, and when we move between them, this seems to be the cost of that. Like, things seem to behave differently here versus here. And, I mean, it's, it's an abstract and vague, but when you think about it in terms of just how we recognize genres, or how we recognize fictions in relation to each other, I think, you know, idealism is, is that particular kind of thinking which allows us to identify the relationship between things, something like a genre. So if a genre is a domain, you know, we kind of know that a genre 
that things in a genre behave and act a certain way, and that certain kinds of entities, or like things and creatures, tend to be in those kinds of genres. And so the question is, like, why do those things go together? You know, what's the myths which let these things interact? But that we know when entities from certain genres enter other ones, there's a sense they don't belong. There's some, there's some sense that there's a relationship between the domain and the kinds of things there, and then the way in which we access them is the way in which we write them. And so um, idealism is really invested in in the sort of domaining of knowledge and the way in which n knowledge and thought gets divided according to its entities and to its capacities. And that idealism doesn't claim to say that, you know, all of this is mere idea, but a certain way of thinking thought in its most abstract state is what allows us to move between categorizations and the things which they categorize. And I think one, um, I'll end with this, um, one example of, of a kind of extreme case of this and how, uh, how, how idealism in its kind of naive, non-naive sense is this kind of navigator of domains and objects uh, as it appears in fiction and in fictional in narratives is tracking how narratives are contained or not contained in other narratives in terms of um, in terms of the their status about how real they are and so I don't have if anyone's ever heard of the Tommy Westfall, Westfall hypothesis this is like pure pop culture junk but it's great uh, so the Tommy Westfall hypothesis was made by this guy named Dwayne McDuffie, who was a uh, comic book writer and um, strong advocate for African American uh, comics and cartoons. And he got constantly attacked for um, you know doing things that didn't seem to fit the bigger universe of of the comic book world. Of doing things like you know uh, he was one of the people that was interviewed when they made you know. Uh, Spider-Man Mexican and people freaked out and he's like why can you believe Spider-Man but not Mexican Spider-Man like what is the you know like what is this what is it about the fictional domains that contain what that makes that possible to get annoyed by that and so in a kind of response he came up with this the Tommy Westphal hypothesis which is this pop this pop culture theory he, he made that at the last episode of the show from the 80s called Saint Elsewhere uh, this, the final, it's about this drama in a hospital. And it pulls out, the camera pulls out, and it turns out that the entire series, except for that episode, took place in the mind of an autistic boy's head. And, like, and he was just staring at a snow globe with a hospital in it, and he made up the whole, the whole series was his creation. And so, Dwayne McDuffie says, okay, now it's possible that, like, if everything he, the, this, so it's a fictional character on a show where the last episode is one step above everything that happened in his head on the show. But there are characters in his head on the show that were on other TV shows. Which means those shows were, could also, or maybe, or definitely, and people argue about this, contained in his head. And so they started mapping, you know. Like, what does this mean? Like, what is this kind of this logic of, contain, of, of contamination, like ideal contamination? All these shows are only in his head. And so there's a, I can't remember, it's like 196 or something now. There's, a, there's actually a visual map of it. It's pretty impressive. Um, but so, I mean, that kind of, you know, that kind of, uh, that kind of idea, this, I mean, it's a kind of extreme example, but this idea of containment and non-containment, that the idea of domain has meaning. You know, it has, like, we, we, things are placed and categorized in, in particular ways which seem to affect the degree to which they exist, even within fictional narratives. So that even, like, oh, a sub-narrative within a sub-narrative seems to have a different stake for us in the way we think it and what it says about how thinking behaves.
So to me, like, this sort of mapping is what idealism has always tried to do, but that it's in its kind of dismissal as making the world ideal, that in order to address this sort of behavior of ideas in fictionalism, we've kind of gone to more and to kind of greater and greater um, linguistic or normative or various stakes which actually uh, emphasize the, the um, human language or emphasize very particular forms of human thinking to explain all these other forms of thinking when in fact idealism is trying to say what is the very generic means of thinking thinking. I mean it's like a very basic question. Um, and so I think f fictions and the way in which fictions demonstrate this tension between entities, methods of access, how we move between the levels and the domains of, of the idea that, that that it's only in acknowledging that that philosophy actually avoids being a fiction itself. Because otherwise, critiques like Laura Wells applies. Because if it thinks that, ideal, you know, if philosophy, whether it calls itself materialism or realism or a pluralism or whatever, if it doesn't kind of acknowledge the usefulness of when it overthinks, <laughs> that it, under this kind of banner of false modesty, it actually it sort of overthinks under the under the name of materialism or realism or under the name of um, semantics or under the name of normativity. So, I think, yeah, philosophy avoids avoids being fiction only by acknowledging that its fictional aspects are necessary for it to abstract properly. I guess I'll stop. Thanks.